jumping here tonight rather than listening to the sound bites from the main part. We will have a more interesting debate here tonight. Our panel tonight is Mark Steele, the comedian, or author, and broadcaster. He's perhaps best known for his Radio 4 series, The Mark Steele Lectures. George Arthur, a trade unionist and leading campaigner in the South Yorkshire Freedom Riders. Although their campaign is still going, they've already reserved some, of, sorry, revised some of the cuts in local transport and pensions in the state. We have Professor Kate Peckett, who is the co-author to the Spirit Level, Why More People and More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better. She's also a founder of the Equality Trust. We have Sam Bereben, a secretary of the People's Assembly. And last but not least, Owen Jones, guardian columnist and the author of his latest book entitled The Establishment. Please welcome our panel. nearly a hundred questions for tonight, so we've had to cut them down and I apologise if your question hasn't been picked. To start off, we're starting with Susan Croft's question, why are people not rising about the current economic and social state of affairs? Justice and the inequality that seems so evident and so so manifest and just so uh, uh, just, just all encompassing and there, there's surely you, you can't help things but you know, I remember when I was sort of 18 the first time you you sort of can't think these things through you think surely if I just explain to people then that everyone will see and then they will come along with me and they will riot uh, that's that's obvious and occasionally those things those thoughts return, you know, they returned to me yesterday when there was this, it just seems so utterly, obviously outrageous and unjust that there can be a, a so-called democracy where it is, it is suggested that it is a marvellous thing for the government to have a hundred people signing this bloody letter on the front page of one of their own newspapers saying, look, look, these people are supporting the government and they don't want Labour. So all my soul are saying, oh, these are the people that matter. So really, these are the only people who should have a vote. I don't know why anybody else has a, a vote unless they have at least 50 million pounds. It's this disgusting thing. And it's, and it's honestly true. I thought I was writing a column about it yesterday. I thought, well, uh, I haven't really got the time or wherewithal to go through all hundred, but I bet if you go through all hundred, you'll find that one or two of them have got all sorts of dodgy tax dealing, tax dodgy connections. But I haven't got the time or the ability to do that, but I will look up the very first one, just on the off chance. His name was Anand, so because it was in alphabetical order, it was in. And I looked him up, and within two minutes I discovered he was the Chief Executive Officer of Green King Breweries, who last year, Her Majesty's Revenue, whatever HMRC stands for, discovered had swiped three hundred million pounds out of his own company in an internal loan in what the HMRC themselves described as making three hundred million pounds vanish into thin air, so he didn't have to pay tax on it. I thought at least give me some sport and not have it the first one. that these people support our government. <laughs>
question and suggest. And, uh, and, and uh, this rage cannot, cannot escape you. But people don't. Not everybody does. And there are a number of reasons, I suspect. And one of the things is, I think, is that, and I think that the, the left, whatever you call it, people who support all the opposition to this injustice and inequality and outrage, then you have to be uh, honest about the fact that when people are beaten, when people do stand up and they're beaten and they don't get their way and the injustice continues and the Antonian bloody pigs carry on as they do, then it doesn't make people feel more outraged and more like right and it makes them feel less like doing it. It makes them feel like there's nothing you can do. It makes people feel that you might as well just look after yourself because they'll always get away with it. And for a long period of time, this has been exclusively the case because there's been loads of marvellous victories that our side has fought and, I believe, crucially, even when our side fights and doesn't win, then that has a, an effect that you might not see. I think, for example, that the fact there was a huge anti-war movement against the Iraq war, clearly it didn't stop the Iraq war, but it did mean that the, the powers that should not be around the world do have to think every time, blimey, we've got to look out for that next time as well. And so it has an effect. But a million people went on the march and a great many drew the conclusion there's not really anything you can do. We all stand up, there's nothing you can do. A few victories, that's what we need. It's been the case for a long time. There are little ones here and there. A few victories, a few things that say, just because you own and control the world doesn't mean you always get your way. And you can see it, and I think there'll be some examples tonight, you can see people become different people. The people who are down and stoop and think there's nothing you can do suddenly become people who think, I am part of the force that can change the world. It only takes a few, and uh, I hope this is part of, of creating those few. Thanks. We could always organise one now, so that's probably inside them, isn't it? <laughs> get arrested now. I'm not that, just get dragged off by the local constabulary. That'd be a, a bleak end to the evening. No, what? People are rioting, and, and it's important Mark made that point about people fighting back and talking about victories, talking about successes, and this is why. The defenders of all injustice, they want us to believe that injustice is a bit like the weather. You can complain about it raining, but there's nothing you can do about it. It's just the way the world is. Tony Benn died last year, and I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room to miss him very much. And he said the way you get change is the burning flame of anger at injustice and the burning flame of hope at a better world. Well, there's so much anger out there and so much fear, but one thing missing, and that's, that's hope. And without hope, people become resigned. They join the biggest party in the country, which isn't Labour or the Tories, certainly not the Lib Dems, it's the yelling at the TV party. <laughs> All their anger is turned on their neighbours, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, later on tonight. Otherwise they give up, and that's why we've got to talk about successes. I think of the students back in 2010, and they had the troubling nutrition fees, the snatching away of the educational maintenance allowance, which summed up a government of millionaires slamming the door in the faces of working class young people across this country. And it was said that, you know, we weren't like the hot-headed French and Greeks that people don't take to the streets in this country. And young people were patronised as the apathetic X-factor generation. But when they had the temerity to actually get politically engaged on their own terms, what happened? Well, they were met with police batons and kettles in freezing temperatures. But they gave hope to other people. Those were the biggest student demonstrations since the 1960s. I think of the strikes of 2011, November 2011, that was the biggest strike since the general strike of 1926. I think of UK or got predominantly young activists amongst others, including in this great city, who occupied shops and businesses whose owners were avoiding tax on an industrial scale, whilst we're constantly told that our services have to be slashed, the social security stripped away because there's not enough money to go around, and they drove the issue of tax avoidance on the agenda. I think of those who fought against the bedroom tax, one of the most cruel and unjust policies a government's inflicted on its own people, forcing predominantly poor disabled people to cough up money they don't have or downsize 
to smaller properties that don't exist. People took to the streets, they organised, including those affected, and they forced Labour to commit to repealing that disgraceful act if they were elected as the next government. I think of the, the electricians who took on Balfour Beatty, a great multinational company, after their terms and conditions and wages were attacked and they went on strike and they occupied and they won. I think of the cinema workers in South London, Brixton Cinema, Ritzy Cinema, who, who fought for the basic principle that everyone in work should have a wage on which they can live. And they, they won despite these huge threats and attacks on them, a massive increase in their wages. The same that occurs on cinema as well. Why do I say this? Because it's the case that actually injustice isn't like the way the politics of hope says all injustice is temporary, it's transient, and it can be overcome if people have enough determination, enough courage, and enough commitment. And that's what our ancestors tell us, that's the history of this country. So yeah, this is a tough time, and lots of people out there feel resigned, and that anger is turned on immigrants and unemployed people and public sector workers, rather than the bankers who plunge this country into economic disaster, the tax dodgers, the poverty paying bosses, those really responsible for the mess that we're in, but there are people fighting back. And the more we celebrate those victories and those successes, the more we embolden other people to fight back as well. So let's leave the number one principle tonight, as every meeting like this, is this. We leave more hopeful than when we entered the room in the first place. We can organise, we can fight back, we can overcome injustice. We're taking a bit of a scenic route at the moment, I'll give you that, but we will overcome. We will overcome and we will build a society run not as a racket for the mean and the greedy, but a society run in the interests of the real wealth creators, working people. I think we're too easily divided and we're too easily convinced um, that other groups don't share our aspirations or our values and we need to come together more. I was home last night with um, my co-author Richard Wilkinson and um, we were watching a film, we don't get out much. <laughs> um, and we're always rather behind the cultural curve. We don't, get, we don't go to the cinema much because it's too loud, I'm feeling a bit like I'm in the cinema this evening. <laughs> yeah. But um, last night we finally caught up with the movie Pride. And um, I'm sure we're probably the last people in this entire room to have seen it. But if anyone else is, uh, is lagging behind, it's about how the lesbian and gay community of London, fighting for gay rights, came together to raise money and support the miners' strike in the early 1980s. And it is moving as well as extremely funny. We were in floods of tears. It was about solidarity, and it was about how groups who are equally oppressed, um, fighting against the powers that be, can come together even if they start out very, very far apart. And watching it, I felt a huge wave of nostalgia for that kind of solidarity, and that isn't something we should be feeling nostalgic about, it's something we should be actively creating every day that we can because too often we're being set one against each other, neighbour against neighbour. And when people try to demonise immigrants, or the unemployed, or the mentally ill, we all need to be standing up and saying, no, we are that tribe as well. We're all one tribe. These mics aren't working. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think if we actually look back just a few years ago, people did actually riot. And I think although the government and the mainstream they try to depoliticise those uh, those events that took place, but actually I think that was an expression 
of uh, a complete, a disaffected youth, people who were very, very angry with the system, people who were very, very angry uh, with everything that was going on, the way that they were being treated, and there was riots that took place actually, you know. Now, I suppose the question really is how you create, how, you, how we can focus that anger into something that's uh, progressive, that's positive, uh, and in a way that actually has a serious impact on society. And I think the biggest hurdle that we've got to overcome really is it's not about how do we win the arguments, the big arguments. On the whole, I think we've won the arguments around privatisation. We've won the arguments around where the NHS, around austerity in lots of different ways. Uh, you know, all of these kind of big questions. I think there's a general sense of radicalisation across society. I think the biggest hurdle that we face is that convincing people that if you fight back, you can win. And I think that's something that we all need to, uh, we all need to think about how, how we overcome. Because if you look back at any real progressive change that's taken place in society, it's always been a mass movement that has been behind it, whether that's the right to vote, the suffragette movement, the, the chartist movement, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, the civil rights movement in America, you know, the student movement in Quebec, uh, you know, I mean, you can go on and on and on. Any serious progressive change has come about from a mass movement. But the, uh, the, the ruling class, the, the rulers, if you like, the mainstream will never say that oh, we didn't do this because of your demonstrations on the streets. We did, or, you know, we didn't do this because of you guys were protesting uh, around that. The anti-war movement is a very good example, actually. You know, we didn't manage to stop the war, but actually in 2003, but Tony Blair left early. The government lost the vote on going to war in Syria uh, uh, last year. And now I think those were testament to the work of the anti-war movement over the last uh, 13 years or over a decade. And I think we've got to remember that. Um, so I think going forwards we need to obviously hold more, uh, have more meetings like this and more things like this, but also convince people that collective action can, uh, can seriously change things at the same time as boosting our, our own victories. And I think that also means rebuilding the trade union movement in this country because they're constantly under attack. It's been, uh, since that year really, decades and decades of uh, the trade unions being hammered, uh, hammered hard. Uh, but we need to start to rebuild that and I think meetings like this will go, I hope people will feel confident uh, to go back to their workplace, take action in their workplace and take their whole thing forward and that's really how I think we can change things, it's by building a serious mass movement uh, around the big political questions. I'd like to just add in the word confidence because it runs through what everyone else has been saying that if you're angry on your own, you're not really likely to do anything unless you're some mad person that goes down the street shouting and uh, having everyone sort of wondering what's up with you. You need to feel that other people are going to join you. And I just want to talk a little bit about the experience of the Freedom Riders in terms of that, because the reason why the Freedom Riders has been such uh, a large movement is because we managed to draw people together. The way we did that, there were five of us spent a whole week just leafleting the bus station and the train station in Barnsley to organise a meeting to protest against the cuts that were taking place in our travel pass concessions. And the result of that was we had a meeting of 300 people in the library. Uh, the caretaker had to start turning people away on health and safety grounds. And that large number of people coming together, and I have to say most of them are people that wouldn't dream of coming to a meeting like this. Some of them are people with uh, an NUM background, some of them uh, women against pit closures, but a lot of them are people that have never been involved in anything they describe as politics or protest in their life before. They just suddenly felt that something was unjust, they came together with lots of other people, and they felt they could do something. And so we took on uh, Northern Rail and the British Transport Police, uh, and people felt, because we were discussing every week about how we carried on the campaign, there was a real democracy, people felt they were involved in it, because I think this is very important as well, that whatever movement takes place, everyone that's in it must feel that they have their ideas listened to, they contribute to things, and that gives you even greater power. And so when we had the uh, incident on, in June last year, when myself and my colleague were arrested quite brutally by the British Transport Police, I think Northern Rail felt that that was going to be an end of it. We're talking about people in their 60s, 70s and 80s seeing sort of a really nasty punch-up on Sheffield Station. 
And it didn't make people disillusioned because we built up that idea of people coming together, discussing things each week. It actually put some backbone into people even more and they said, no, we're not going to go away. So I think that theme of confidence is really important. I think the other thing we have to say is that we need to look forward. You know, in all of our minds, it's May the 7th, and there's obviously going to be some sort of political change there. But actually, I don't think that political change is going to be that significant. I don't think that whichever government comes in on May the 7th is suddenly going to turn around to pensioners in South Yorkshire and say, you can have all the money you're asking for for your travel arrangements to come back. And I think the fight will carry on. And what we've got to do is to say to people in trade unions, many of whose leaderships in those trade unions have said, wait for the election. Let's see if Labour gets in and make things better. Well, it didn't make things an awful lot better in 1997, did it? And I think the way we're leading into the election in May, we don't have much to hope from, from any government that comes in. We need to be prepared to go out, whatever the government is, fight back and say, no, we're not going to see people suffer more from austerity. <laughs> Okay, the next question is from Richard Bridge. Citizens have the right to food. How would you remove the need for food banks and over the next five years? This is Britain in 2015. It's the sixth biggest economy on the face of the earth. The wealth of the richest 1,000 people has doubled in the last five years, during one of the greatest economic traumas in the history of this nation. And last year, nearly one million of our fellow citizens were driven into the arms of food banks. 300,000 of them children. One of the richest countries that has ever existed on the face of the earth. And apparently, we can no longer afford to feed our poorest people. There is no greater indictment of our current society than that. But we can change it. We can change it. It comes back to that point I make about injustice being temporary and transient and can be overcome. The reason we've got exploding food banks is a number of reasons. Firstly, there's in work poverty. We live in a country where most people in poverty are in work, they get up in the morning and they earn their poverty day after day. And if they're not dependent on food banks, they're dependent on in work benefits, which cost huge amounts of money. Uh, or personal debt, legal loan sharks and so on, uh, in order to uh, feed their kids, to pay the rent and, and so on and so forth. So we've got to have no ifs, no buts. Every single person in work in this country must have a living wage. It's as simple as that. The second point is the attack on social security. One of the main reasons for the prolifer prol proliferation of food banks, one of them is delays in benefits, all too often intentional in order to deter people from claiming in the first place. Around £20 billion pounds worth of benefits that people are eligible for go and claim each year. Compare that to the £1.2 billion that is lost through benefit fraud. Benefit evasion is effectively a bigger problem than benefit fraud. Now this is a problem. Lots of people, they face these huge delays, they lose their job, they can't claim anything. They have absolutely nothing whatsoever. We've got to end those delays once and for all, and they're entirely political. But of course, another point is benefit sanction. For those who don't know what that means, and I'm sure many of you do, it means your benefits are stopped, suspended, uh, for between four weeks and two years, where regardless of circumstances, you cannot, uh, you cannot claim a single penny in Social Security. Now, I want to give you an example, because in the last 18 months, I can bandy around statistics, uh, over a million unemployed people uh, have had their benefits sanctioned. But I want to give you an example. A 60-year-old man called Stephen Taylor. And this man was an army veteran in Manchester, desperately looking for work. And many of you will know better than myself, if you're out of work at the age of 60, it's so hard to find work, but he was trying so hard. And he was selling poppies for the Royal Legion, for maimed and injured former comrades of his, including in a supermarket where he was desperately and unsuccessfully looking for work. He had his benefits stopped, sanctioned for four weeks, this six-year-old army veteran, on the basis his volunteering for the Royal Legion showed he wasn't trying hard enough to look for work. That's where we've come to as a country. Yeah, job centres are encouraged to compete with each other over how many people they can sanction 
in order to dissuade people from claiming benefits in the first place, in order to sort of reduce the official unemployment count. That regime of sanctioning has to end. It is eroding the very basis of social security in this country, and it is driving people into hunger. So we've got to, and finally, the stripping away of benefits for people, disabled people, for example, uh, and others eligible, the freezing of in-work benefits, which in practice means a cut as wages are falling. So we've got to defend social security, we've got to have a living wage, and we've got to end the sanctioning of people for political purposes, and then we will end once and for all the scandal of hunger, because in this booming, prosperous nation, which is what we have, not one single person should be living in hunger, and we can't rest until we stop that, that from ever happening in this good Yeah. something else really quite awful to our society, um, although I agree with Owen about how, how deeply shocking it is that, that we have them in modern Britain. I lived in America for 16 years as an adult and I always used to feel a bit smug because I used to think at least I come from a country that doesn't have soup kitchens. <laughs> and then you know, I come back and, and here they are and many, many people in desperate circumstances needing to use them. But using food banks has become another stick to beat the poor with. Not only are they suffering the stigma of needing to use food banks, but then they're criticised for not having spent their money properly, having spent it on things they don't need, or even when they're there, you know, not taking food that's good and healthy for them. I was at a meeting of academics recently, I heard somebody complaining that in the food parcels being given away in Leeds and Bradford, people are given sugar. You know, as if poor children don't get to have a birthday cake. And, and it's yet one more way in which we judge the poor. They are feckless and reckless enough to need food banks in the first place and then they don't know how to feed their children properly and they don't know how to cook nourishing meals and they shouldn't be having this and they shouldn't be their large screen TVs. Let them eat kale. And we've got to avoid that middle class stigmatisation of people in need. From some of that, first of all, one of the ways one of the ways to eliminate this exactly what the question was: how do we get rid of the, the need for food banks? One of the, the things that creates the food banks it's not just the economics of it; it's attitude. Uh, attitude has, has created this as much as the fact that they cut benefits uh, and, and so on. An attitude that means that here, Duncan Smith, for example, this chap lives in a house with, now I'm going to correct me if I've got the statistics of this wrong, he's got eight spare bedrooms I believe, and uh, he's earned this because this is the Tory philosophy, that you don't have this wealth unless you've earned it, and he's earned it because his father-in-law gave him a house, isn't that right? Yeah. So that's, no, now uh, if the rest of us put a little bit more effort in, we might have a father-in-law. <laughs> Smith is the man whose job it is, is to defend the regime that's called food banks. And of course, inevitably then, if you're going to defend it, then you're going to end up saying, well, these people are feckless, they don't really need to go down there, they're just trying to get free crisps, because this is, uh, this is the sort of things they say uh, that, that, they, that they claim happen. But it's, and so it's attitude, not obviously the rule changes are important, but it reminds me of I'm sure I will remember this. About a year ago, we were in Bristol, and I remember a very uh, moving speech from a woman who was disabled. And she described uh, getting a letter that, as it turned out, had been sent by a relative, and it came recorded delivery. Uh, such an innocuous thing to happen in the day, and it completely transformed her next two days because she, I think it must have been on a Friday, she couldn't go down to the post office to get it on a Monday, till the Monday. 
And all weekend, she said, I was terrified. I couldn't sleep. My heart was racing because I knew that when people have their benefits cut, as they do, all of a sudden, randomly, might not be any reason for it, then they're cut for weeks and weeks and weeks while you appeal and appeal and appeal, and it always comes in an unexpected letter, recorded delivery. Like some sort of deliberate sadism, the sort of thing you'd expect from the Sopranos. And this letter had come, and she was terrified. And for the next three days, that was a lie. Till it turned out it was something innocuous from a relative, or oh, should hope was given a good talking to, not to say anything like that again. <laughs> not their fault, of course. But this is, uh, this is attitude. This is attitude that's made that happen. Because as well as the, the rule changes, an attitude has been brought in that these people don't deserve anything. These are the people who are robbing us. The poor, these are the people. Where's all the money gone in society? We used to have money for things and it's all gone. Who must have taken it? The poor, obviously. They're the ones who robbed it all, these tramps rolling around in their gold. And, and it's that attitude that has created the situation where the food banks are, uh, are necessary. Because even if, you have, even if you did have unemployed people, if you had an attitude that said, well, these people are not the creators of their own poverty, then there, there would be, uh, the, the, then obviously there would be something done to help them rather than just to stigmatise them. And so the answer, how do we get rid of that? And how do we get rid of that attitude? I think, I think we have to find ways of organising around the food banks. I think that um, we've, we've not done that as much as we should um, at, at all. And I was interested to read that Syriza, the uh, anti-establishment party that's become elected in, in Greece, that this was one of the things that they did. Now, obviously, their, their situation is more extreme than we've had here, but that was one of the things that they did, was they went down to their food banks. We were in a whole town sometimes, depending on food banks, but they went down there and they organised people and demonstrations and rallies and all the things that you could do and all the imaginative protests that they did by going down to the food banks and speaking to people there and, and talking to them about it. And I would, I think that's the sort of thing that a People's Assembly worth its, its name ought to be we ought to think about uh, about that in the coming period, whoever wins the election, that we go down to the food banks and we start to organise in some sort of way. You know, I'm not, you know, I've no idea how exactly, but I think in some way that that is something very much that we ought to be doing. I think um, something else that needs saying about the food banks, the impressions given that people can just truck down there every week and get something, and of course they can't. There's a very severe limit on how many times you can actually go to a food bank and get something. So it's not just that the food banks show something appalling about our country, but they don't do very much to alleviate the deprivation of people that are using them. Um, I think what Mark was saying there about trying to organise around the food banks is quite an interesting point. I know in Barnsley, uh, Unite the Community have been really good at supporting the food banks and uh, I think that idea of trying to link activists who are wanting to change things with those people that are going to the food banks for support is a really useful idea in building things up. And um, I just wanted to sort of, people have touched about the, the sanctions and so on and said it's not just the food banks that we need to be looking at. When we were campaigning to get the Freedom Riders started, we found lots and lots of pensioners who were using the train service to travel from Barnsley to Meadowhall every day during the winter so that they could sit in Meadowhall all day long and they didn't have to heat their houses. And there would have been this winter, again, I've not seen the final figures yet, but there will be thousands of old age pensioners who will have died because of hypothermia, because they're frightened of heating their houses. Now, you know, to answer the question, um, how would you remove the need for food banks and stopping sort of elderly people being treated that way? Well, we all know the answer, don't we? The wealth in this country is more divided than it's been in our lifetime. It's take some of that money off of the rich through the taxes that they're not being, uh, not being drained out of them and use that to provide decent social services, start creating decent jobs. Perhaps some jobs could be created by getting people building houses, providing uh, jobs through the councils that are being cut back time and time again, so we get to take people off unemployment. 
use that money usefully to create a society that's going forward. And it was really summed up for me with the film that Ken Loach made, The Spirit of 45. If after six years of war, and this country really was bankrupt at that time in 1945, we could have a government that decided to build council houses, bring in a health service, decent secondary school ed education, and all the other benefits, if that would happen then, why isn't that possible today when there's so much more money around? Tax the rich and tax the rich. Yeah, I don't really want to repeat what's been said because I think enough has been said. But I think it's worth pointing out that we've just come out of or, or just come out of the longest fall. This government and austerity is responsible for the longest fall in living standards since records began, since the 1800s. Yet, while in the same period that this has happened, the richest thousand people in the country have doubled their wealth. The richest thousand people have doubled their wealth since the recession began, since the recession hit uh, in 2008. So I think it's an absolute disgrace that you know, in one of the, like, as I was saying, one of the richest countries in, uh, in the, on the planet, uh, we've got up to a million people uh, relying on food banks. I actually used to work in, uh, this, I'm going back seven years now, six, seven years, I used to work in a, 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 a drop-in for homeless people, uh, which essentially provided, you know, which essentially was a food bank for those kind of people. My dad actually still runs the place. Um, but now he's saying that it got to the stage even seven years ago where we just couldn't even accommodate the amount of people that were coming in uh, saying that they needed emergency food supplies. This is six years ago uh, and now they've got to a stage where literally they have to, they all, in order to, for people to get food from, the, from this place, they have to kind of check whether or not people are homeless and you know you kind of get into the stage where even the very most, most well-meaning projects and all this kind of stuff aren't able to provide this, the kind of uh, the, the level of support and food that people are needing. And I think the problem that the food banks, and, and there's lots of very, very good people, I think, the food, involved with the food banks is an incredible, uh, incredibly inspiring movement, but it is true that it doesn't actually address the real issue, it doesn't address the real problem. Uh, and the food banks as a charity aren't actually able to, uh, to do this under the laws and all these kind of things. So that, I think, does mean that we do, it, it's up to us to go along to the food banks, as Mark and people have said, we do need to start creating the links and bring the political issues along to those places because, you know, these are the people that are being hit hardest. We need these people at the centre of our movement. We need to break out of the kind of, uh, kind of you know, the lefty ghetto that, uh, that has been about for far too long and start involving these kind of people and these, these kind of people need to be leading this campaign uh, uh, around around austerity. So I think, um, I think for all of those reasons, it's actually up to us to bring the politics into the kind of food bank movement that's erupted, uh, which doesn't mean we have to go down there straight away and start making links with these people. socialist MP in this 
nation's history, and he turned up in the kind of traditional working class garments of the day, and he was stopped at the gates of the House of Commons, and the police officer said, are you here to work on the roof? And he said, no, I'm here to work on the floor. And that, and that was the beginning of a new generation of MPs, the idea they were there to represent the interests of those who worked, the working people, the party of, of Labour. And, you know, back then people were more likely to work in mines and factories and steelworks, these days more likely to work in supermarkets and call centres and offices, but people still need, working people need a political voice now as much as they ever did. And again, you know, you get this constant demonisation of our trade union, trade union movement, across the spectrum actually. The biggest democratic movement in this country, a movement that represents supermarket workers, lollipop ladies, factory workers, care workers, the pillars of any decent society. Labour's leaders should be proud of the fact they're bankrolled by working people, and if anyone should be ashamed of their funding arrangements, it should be a Conservative Party bankrolled by bankers and hedge fund managers and legal loan sharks. It's about time they were made to feel ashamed of who they champion. And they, it's interesting because the Tories know which side they're on. You know, and to quote, I think it's Bertrand Russell, to paraphrase it, one side preaches the class war and the other fights it. And this lot fight the class war. You stand up for the bottom 70%, they call you a class war. I mean, you stand up for the top 1%, they call you a moderate. But have no <laughs> doubt, these people are class warriors. And you saw it with this list of tax dodgers and poverty paying bosses effectively trying to threaten and blackmail the British people into voting the right way. But look, Labour's obviously not been offering the coherent, inspiring alternative that this country so desperately needs. Of course that's the case. But it's up to, it's up to us, partly. It's up to us. There will be a choice, given our electoral system, between a Labour-led government and a Conservative-led government. In five weeks' time, nearly, exactly, if we all wake up with David Cameron's snug face waving from number 10, we're not going to feel very happy. And we have to stop that from happening. But what we've got to do, if Labour comes to power, is to put as much pressure on them as possible. And we did it on the bedroom tax, got them to commit to repealing it. We did it, they're not going far enough on tax avoidance, but the fact they're saying about anything about cramping down on tax avoidance is because people took to the streets, it's people power that achieved that. The same with reversing the privatisation of the NHS, and they're even talking about how they were wrong themselves to privatise and fragment the NHS. And that again was activists fighting from below. So we've got to keep pushing. And if they come to power, we have to organise from below to get them to stick to their existing commitments but push them further. But I would say this, I would prefer to be fighting a Labour government than fighting a Tory government led by Ian Duncan Smith, Andrew Lansley, Michael Gove, and George Osborne. So let's kick this lot out in five weeks. Let's kick them out. But if we kick them out, let's build pressure on this lot in power. Let's try and get rid of this electoral system and have an electoral system where we can actually vote for who we want without any fear of retribution. But if we do that, we kick these people out, the real battle begins. That's when we organise, that's when we fight to get a government that represents working people, not a government that represents the tiny group of people at the top. It's absolutely right that sort of um, the point that Owen finished on, that sort of after May the 7th we need to be prepared to fight whether it's a Tory controlled government or a Labour controlled government. And for me, one of the really sad things about this present period is we've got Ed Miliband as the leader of the Labour Party and his father wrote two of the best classic books about the Labour Party explaining why every time the Labour Party's come into power it's ended up doing the job of the bosses and not standing up for the workers. And it's a history that goes back right through to the interwar period when McDonald's sort of was determined to keep the pound tied to the gold standard and that meant cutting the benefits of people in absolutely savage manner at that time. And so the fact that Ralph Milliband could sort of lay all that out and people, if people haven't read his books, it's well worth going and reading them because it's not just a question of, you know, is Labour good or bad? Whenever it gets into government, it thinks it has to run the system. And we can see the problem um, that that leads to. In Greece, 
It's linked to the smashing of PASOK, the Labour Party equivalent in Greece, because people got so fed up and disillusioned with it carrying out the same kind of policies that I think an Ed Miliband government would carry out. And so we see Syriza uh, in power in Greece. But already there are lots of pressures on Syriza and they're backing down on a lot of the promises they made in, in the election. And I don't think that they've really understood that when you get into government, there's a limit on what your power is. The banks don't have anyone voting for them. The big companies don't have anyone voting who's going to be on their boards. What we need to do is to create a situation where people have the confidence to fight back, which takes us back to the trade unions. But also, I think, given the way that the Labour Party's gone, I don't see this coming election as just a fight between Labour and the Tories. I hope there's going to be a very significant vote for parties that are putting forward policies to the left of the Labour Party, so that if the Labour Party do get in, there is a very strong warning shot fired across their bowels that says people want something better than austerity under Labour. That's what we've got to make sure happens in this election. Made a note there, socialists, not socialist party, but socialists within it, exactly agree with uh, Owen and Tony Ben. He said the Tony Ben quote I keep thinking of, which I'm not sure is relevant, but someone told me that they, they, uh, that, that they met him when he was during the, the run up to the war with Iraq and he was going out to Iraq to meet Saddam Hussein. And he said, to, I was talking to him, he said to me, um, I'm going to be in Shaban Shade on Sunday. I'm going Sunday because I'm going to be in Leeds on Tuesday. So the, the Labour Party is uh, uh, clearly, you know, it, it was it was born out of a need for, for socialism, and it's it, there are many people in it who are clearly brilliant socialists. There's no question about that. The question of why it backs austerity, I think, you have to sort of stand back for a minute and look at the bigger picture and ask a question. Who controls society? Is it Parliament that controls society in the first place? And there are many, many examples that tell you that it doesn't. That the banks, for example, even if you had a radical Labour Party, if you had a radical government, whatever it was called, that said, Right, we are therefore going to pass a law that says that the banks have to hand over their wealth that they've stolen off us. They would not go, well, we seem to have lost that one and do it. <laughs> they have a million ways of subverting the law. All the things that if any of us did it, they would say, but you've broken the law. And they do that and they put billions of pounds into their wife's name in Monaco, to pick one example from the guy who runs Topshop and so on. They have the Tony Ben himself when he was Postmaster General, he was the person in charge of the post office, came up with the idea that the stamp shouldn't have the Queen's head on it. Perfectly reasonable, you would think, especially with an elected person in charge of the post office, not the most radical thing ever, and the civil servants and the bureaucrats and all the people in charge of such things, quite open about this now, they did all they could to block him. People whose names we never know, because they were never elected, never could be elected by anybody. These people stop the elected people, and they do it, and they've done it over the last hundred years they have stopped anything that, rad that, that radical or anything that the people in charge do not like. They have stopped not everything but most of the things that Labour have, have tried to do in, in that area. Therefore, Labour bit by bit accommodates. We can't do that. There's no point in putting that thing forward. We're going to have to try and put, up, put something up that, that, that they will accept and so on, leading to the abomination that is Tony Blair. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, having said all of that, all of which I think the conclusion should be therefore that the way we change things is by what the rest of us do. How can we confront the banks, the people who run the top of society, the military and so on? Having said that, that Parliament doesn't control everything, I think it's ridiculous to suggest that it doesn't control anything because it does matter. It matters, first of all, because it does pass some laws, and it matters also because who wins an election changes an enormous amount 
the way that people think about politics. And I simply would not understand someone who says that they are against injustice, against inequality, against the people at the top of society being able to do whatever they want, and therefore don't care whether or not a bloke who runs the Labour Party who went to a comprehensive school who is sneered at by Etonian, bloody Etonian, Bullingdon Club, worst sort of 19... 30 bullies, which one of those two gets in? It clearly matters. It clearly matters that they think that they can put a hundred people on a newspaper that are the worst, most filthiest people in society and say, look, look at the people who are supporting us. Labour, I mean, I was quite pleased because I thought Labour in the past, but then gone, no, 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 some of the evil bastards support us as well. <laughs> but, they, uh, they did, I suspect, probably Ed Balls was locked in a cupboard, wasn't he? <laughs> There is an immense difference. I simply cannot understand anyone who said there is no difference between the two. Uh, one, there is a party that introduced the bedroom tax, there is a party that is saying we are going to oppose the bed, we are going to scrap the bedroom tax. They may not do it, I don't know, but there clearly is a difference between those two. There is a party that is mates with Rupert Murdoch, there is a party that maybe sometimes equivocates about Rupert Murdoch, but at least Billy Bannon has stood, stood up to him in certain ways. There's a party that, has, uh, that, that is full of the energy company bosses, some of the most appalling people uh, on this, in this country, and there is a, a party that has at least said it wants to freeze their prices. And the Tories then went berserk, if you remember. How dare you take away the ordinary person's right to own an energy company and put up prices? <laughs> taking away the right of the common man. Now, in a while, I'll just finish with this, I've gone on to but I think that, in, in one way, making it the most important question is wrong, because the most important thing is, are you opposed to all this inequality that goes on? And there's a number of things you can do, you can, and that's the most important question. If you are opposed to it, you might think the best way to vote is Labour, or possibly Green, or Scottish Nationalist, or maybe not vote at all. But, uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't matter at all who gets in. I think it is very exciting that once it becomes clear that there's a possibility of someone with a much more radical message winning, as we did in Scotland, suddenly, suddenly it becomes all these people who've gone, oh, there's no point in voting, I agree with them, but there's no point in voting for them because they've got no chance of winning. Suddenly that changes, and I think that that's very exciting, and I think it is possible that a new party could emerge that, that would make things different. But at the moment, I, I think that the Labour Party, to answer the question, the Labour Party is half a socialist party, the socialists within it. It does matter that they, that Ed Miliband gets in and not Cameron. However, uh, that, is, that is not the only question and these are not the people who control society. society apart from um, the bankers and the finances of those in the media. <laughs> and I think it astonished me after the last general election how quickly the Conservative, the coalition government were allowed to capture a narrative that was completely untrue yes. because they had the media in their pockets and they could tell the story of a global financial crash as if it was Gordon Brown's fault. Yeah. <laughs> and that really went unchallenged, I think because the Labour Party at that point felt so defeated and so down um, that they didn't really have the energy to fight back at that point. We were at Labour Party conference that year, just before that election, and they did seem like a depressed and defeated and defensive party, and I don't think they got back on their feet quick enough to come out swinging after the election and show how untrue those statements were. And we've, we've fed that line ever since, as if all of the economic problems of this country were down to the Labour Party over the last few years. I don't think Ed Balls has been locked in cupboard, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I do think another thing happens in unequal societies, 
um, where status matters so much more. It means that everybody who gets the taste of power, it becomes really quite important for them to try and hang on to it. And that is true of our Labour members of Parliament and previous ministers and prime ministers as it is of others. Paul Foote called it the aristocratic embrace. He described how when the early Labour MPs, some of them were elected, uh, moved up into, elevated into the House of Lords. And when you get some um, swathed in ermine and um, you get to take part in pretentious ceremonies in, in um, panelled buildings, you become part of the establishment. It becomes harder and harder to rock the boat. And the longer our politicians stick around, the more conservative with a small c they all become. They don't like to look radical. They think it looks a bit rude. They don't want to be accused of the politics of envy. They de-radicalise wherever they start from. We probably just need to have term limits on each of them, as well as on, on parliaments. But also, we need to not allow politics to be captured by the career politicians and those who just are groomed from it from an early age. And you can see them you know, at universities like where I teach, those studying PPE, politics, philosophy and economics, planning to go and get a job in party offices and work their way up. We don't need that. We need more people who, who know a bit about real life outside of the Westminster village. Okay, well, I, I don't want to be taking much time, but I think, um, I think it basically comes down to, do we want things uh, do we think that things getting worse for us is going to increase the confidence across the, 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 the population? Or do we think things getting slightly better, although still shit, uh, is going to get, will make us feel better for that? And, you know, which, which is the, be the best outcome of that in terms of going forward? If we recognise the fact that whatever happens at the election, we're still going to need to uh, tackle austerity, we're still going to need to do that, whatever the result of it is, whether the Tories leave the government, whether the Labour Party leaves the government, we're still going to have to have a movement. So which is going to be the better outcome, which makes people feel more confident to fight back about it? I think that would be a Labour-led Labour government. Now, I'm not a, a member of the Labour Party myself, by the way, at all, and I have no illusions that they're going to provide any kind of serious change in terms of what we all want to see. However, I do believe that people will feel more confident to fight back and to take further action if we get a Labour-led government at the election, and essentially that's what I want to see. Now, um, I also think that if you look over the last few years, I think more and more people are getting uh, disillusioned with the politics coming out of Westminster altogether. Uh, and I think that's... So it's our job, I think, now to... And, and if if the turnout was, you know, 100%, say, in the country that voted, Labour would win an absolute majority. It's guaranteed that that would happen. But I think people are so disillusioned with politics because you hear the same old sh crap from politician after politician after politician. You do hear the same old stuff. Uh, that I think that means that we need to meet people where they're at. And I think if you look over the last uh, decade or so, more people have been taking part in demonstrations, more people have been, even things like signing petitions, uh, you know, the kind of extra parliamentary, if you like, uh, side of politics has been on the increase, actually. So I think that's where we need to hit people where we're at. That's why I think the People's Assembly is important, that creating a mass movement that can create a pole of attraction in society that says there is an alternative and this is something that you won't hear in the mainstream uh, and that can put demands on the politicians. So I think going forward, that's, um, that's what we need to do more. Thank you. Slight change of pace for the next question, but Julie is going to read it out. Hi, yeah, I work as a teaching assistant in a nursery class at a local primary school. A couple of weeks ago, our governing body voted to pursue academy status. The proposal involves three local schools, two primary and a secondary, and they're seeking to form a multi-academy trust. From the outset, support staff in my school have been concerned about the proposal, and at a unison meeting in my school last week, staff decided to launch a campaign to fight the proposal. 
We've produced a leaflet which we are dis distributing door to door in the catchment area of all three schools. A group of parents also met and we intend to call a public meeting. I have a petition here which I hope to get as many signatures as possible to present to the governing bodies of the school. One thing we are pushing for is a proper consultation process and that a binding ballot of parents and staff is held to inform this important decision. This is something that they don't have to do. What do the panel think about schools moving from local authority control to becoming academies? And will the panel endorse our campaign and sign the petition? Julie, well, too, I can, you'll have to stop me here because I can, uh, I can bore you for many a day with this because about uh, three years ago, for a reason I'm not entirely sure why, uh, I seemed to move down to Hove and, <laughs> and uh, about a year ago, the school where the stepdaughter was going to, uh, Suddenly it was announced that it was going to become an academy. And I, the bit of what you said to Julia that really, really strikes with me is a proper consultation process. Because it turns out that the rules of how to change a school from uh, one that's, to, that's connected to the local authority into an academy, a consultation process has to take place. But, this is the words, a consultation, pra uh, a consultation is deemed to have taken place if the parents are told that it is going on. <laughs> now, that's a consultation process that Vladimir Putin would be happy to do. <laughs> so, out come the brochures, out come all these little, the marvellous little glossy brochures, the sort you get from a tourist office. I don't know if you recognise any of this. These are the marvellous uh, buildings that you'll have when there's an academy. This is what's going to happen. It's going to be terrific. It's going to be, you're going to have money. If we don't, I mean, literally, if we don't go this way, there will be no money for the school at all. The buildings will rot. I mean, then we were taken to this sort of thing where they consulted us by telling us this and shown films. You couldn't spoof it better. There was a picture of a rotting building. That's what it's going to be without an academy. And then this sort of drawing, this space agent sort of thing, like something from a 1970s science fiction. This is that your children will go to school in spaceships and live on <laughs> And so on. So, a meeting was called at which people, very anxious, not particularly radical constituency, very marginal uh, uh, constituency politically, uh, and people that, you know, you sort of think, are you going to go with it? Someone came down and spoke very well about the need for direct action. I found myself thinking, oh, I can't see the neighbours going for that. And the neighbours did go for that. They all voted for it through the hats in the air and so on. But it, was, it seemed utterly impossible. I don't know, you may feel this. It seems impossible. It's that's it, it's done. There's no point in complaining and arguing. So we did the things you do. There was petitions and there was meetings and there was rallies and there was sort of benefits and a march and there was that sort of thing. And in particular, and this was where something was uh, in our favour, two things that were very important. The first was that the Green Party, who have a big, uh, the, the biggest party in the council, ordered the parents to have a ballot, ordered, the, ordered there to be a, an official parents' ballot, uh, which the school didn't like. Such was their commitment to democracy. <laughs> and the teachers, in a school where there was no history of any trade union at, at all, formed, some of them joined the union, and within a month, be, the two things went together, the campaign of the, te of the teachers alongside the campaign of the parents went together, each giving each other confidence. The teachers got enough people into the union to call a strike. Not everybody was in the union at that time. The headmaster was so arrogant that then even the people who were in the union said they'd support the strike and the school was completely <laughs> shut for a day. And on top of that, the banner, we won 72 to 28 per cent. At which point, at which point, the headmaster, the headmaster and the local Conservative MP said that this makes absolutely no difference. It's got nothing to do with what you vote for. Why, and so, and, 
and then just trash the, the, the whole thing like that so the campaign had to go on. I won't bore you with all the other things, except to say that bit by bit we won the press round. We won, and this weren't easy. It seems like I'm just sort of reeling these things off as if we went down like the way it would be in a Hollywood movie. We went down and the press said, but we can't support this. This is as outrageous. We won around and gave them a cup of tea. It was more difficult than that. But bit by bit, the press, the local television were down every day. They are so arrogant. They're not used to a proper fight. The heads and Michael Gove was back in this, incidentally. The day that the ballot uh, result came out was the same day that Michael Gove was kicked out of the cabinet. <laughs> at that point, um, at that point, one by one, like in Twelve Angry Men, except it was men and women, we the board of governors, one by one. One people round, not really because they were politically one to the idea of the anti-academy, but they could see that the whole city was against them. It was on the local telly every night, it was on the front page of the local paper every day, there was marches and rallies and kids singing and dancing with placards every day. And in the end, the Board of Governors just chucked the towel in and said, all right, you're not going to have the academy, and they gave up. And the most, I'll just finish with this, this was the most, uh, if it was a Hollywood film, you would say this is an outrageous ending, it couldn't happen. We had elections for three more vacant posts on the Board of Governors. We stood three people at the Academy, we won by a landslide, all three got on, which made it even more annoying for the head. This head, incidentally, was going to be head of, what was it, you, the phrase you used, a multi-academy network, some great Ponzi bloody thing. He was going to be, most, most pertinently, he was going to be able to award himself a 250 grand a year salary, whatever the phrase was. All of that was in ruins for him. He's now got to face a board of governors that hate him. <laughs> and at the next meeting, he broke down in the meeting and started crying. <laughs> at which point, it was his bad luck that one of the people we'd stood, who won the post of the board of governors, happened to be a mental health nurse. <laughs> who then was given the job of going through all the process of getting into deep green, green breaths and calm blue ocean or whatever you say, uh, breathing into a bag, Mr Trigger, it's fine, you'll be fine. At which point he just gave up the whole thing and this week he left the school altogether. <laughs> not an academy and if you go to the school now and you see the, te the teachers are literally an inch taller than they were a year ago. They were in fear. You spoke to them, they dare, even at the meetings, they dare them. They're like you sort of filled you see of people in Soviet Union in 1960 or something, scared to speak. And now they speak there like the, every time that the head tries to bring in, well he's gone now, but the old, every time he tried to bring in uh, some new regulation where they had to work on grounds or something, they just said, well we're not doing it. And they felt different people. Everyone who's taken part in that campaign feels like a different person. They feel like if we all stand up, at least we've got a chance. And people, the kids, the, the, the teachers, everyone who took part feels brilliant about it. So all I could so I don't know, I hope that gives some answer to your question. <laughs> in particular, I would say this. When they say there's nothing you can do, it's clearly you don't believe this because you're, you're standing up saying this thing to do it, but when they say, no, that's it, it's decided, the consultation's gone through, you've all disagreed with it, and, that, and so we've taken that as agreeing with it. When they, when they say that, do not believe them because you can win. admissions, 
in areas where um, it is difficult to get children into good schools unless you pay an awful lot for extremely expensive houses. In Brighton, they did have randomization of admissions for secondary school. And a lot of middle class parents said that wasn't fair. <laughs> which suggests their children needed a decent mathematics education if they're not going to end up um, with as good a grasp of statistics as Ian Duncan Smith. <laughs> Actually, Michael Goh's not very good either. He wants all our schools to be above average. <laughs> But as well as moving on schools into local authority control, I think we should be reforming early childhood education to emphasise the role of play. Yes. I think we should be revisiting our national curriculum to think about a more well-rounded and balanced education and getting rid of standardised tests that just pit one school against another school and trap our children in, in rote learning and restrict them from a full exploration of their own capabilities. And I'd be in favour of randomised admissions to universities as well. I suggested this to the Dean of an Oxford College um, <laughs> at, at a dinner one night. I said, why not just, you know, have a pool of people who've all got, you know, the same qualifications, you know, plenty of people across the um, whole educational spectrum with good A-level results and then randomly select some to come to your college. And it took him a while to grasp what I meant. It was an alien idea. And then he simply said, no, that wouldn't work at all. Um, which is a bit like Ian Duncan Smith saying, I don't accept those things. Um, but bringing back some democracy into our educational system would be incredibly transformative we would all be thinking about how we work to make every school the best it could be for all of our children. We wouldn't need pupil premiums. You know, we would just have good schools in every neighbourhood for all children. I, I think all of us on the panel and everyone in the room agrees that academies should go, and I'm sure everyone will be making sure they sign the petition uh, as they leave tonight. And I think that point about how the whole academy process is part of destroying education is so important, is part of a privatisation drive that's taking part in education, the same as it is in the NHS and every aspect of our life. And really what we need to say is that it's time that things were turned around. The point that Kate was making about sort of what education should be is so very important. I came into teaching quite late in my life. Uh, it was at the time that you could still talk about child-centred education and the idea that uh, children in a primary school where I taught should be able to enjoy coming. We've actually got a situation now where the actual reading standards that can be achieved in primary schools have gone up on what they were when I started teaching. We've also reached the standard that very few children now, compared to them, actually enjoy reading. Now, what's the point in actually teaching people basic skills that they don't enjoy and aren't prepared to use? For me, education isn't about learning facts, which is what seems to be drilled in all the time now. Education is about learning out about how you find out facts and how you use them. And one of the things that struck me when I first moved to Barnes in the 1970s, an area that was dominated by collieries, was the number of people who'd left school at a very early age, who got into the union and had become skilled at being able to negotiate and trip managers up every time with their ability to find out the information that was necessary to put their case and to put it over and then to go to mass meetings of their workmates and convince them that if necessary they come out on strike. This is something that sort of working class education should be about, about showing how we use our skills to a purpose and try and make things better for society. But one other thing we have to say about academics, well, well first of all, I hope that what Mark said is going to be taken out of the video that's being made and shown to every school that's supposed to be in an academy because I thought that was a classic <laughs> 
and we have to emphasise it, it isn't the only example of academies being defeated. Now, I, I, I don't know if you've been in touch with it, but there is an anti-academies alliance that my union, the NUT, has put quite a lot of effort into developing. And that puts out information constantly about campaigns, many of which have failed, but a significant number of which have been successful. So we need to say that we have to put that information out and give confidence to people to fight back. I don't know whether Owen or anyone else knows what the Labour Party policy on this is. I, I, I saw Tristram Hunt uh, the other day seem to be saying that he's in favour of grammar schools staying, which I think is really quite appalling. Um, we have to remember, it was under the Blair government that the whole academy programme was started. Lord Adonis brought it in uh, on the basis that this was going to take failing schools and make them better. We've now got lots of academies in this country that are failing. Yeah, what's the answer to failing academies, which meant to be the answer to failing schools? You've got a complete utter nonsense. And the only reason for bringing in academies is that thing that I said at the outset. It's about bringing privatisation into education. Just lastly, on free schools. Um, in Barnsley, um, our college, which seems to think it's one of the big players in the town, decided, or, or the... Um, the principal of the college decided that he wanted the college to set up a free school in Barnsley. And so he had a meeting last year where he invited parents to come along and discuss setting up a free school that the college uh, would, would have built. Because the response was looking as though it was very poor, he actually sent an email around all the staff saying, whether you've got children or not, will you come along to the meeting and support me? And very few people did turn up. He still went ahead with his plans. And we found out last week the number of people that applied to start at the free school in September. And there's a bit of an argument about the numbers. There's two different figures I've heard. The figure that the, the college is putting out is that eight applied. <laughs> but I'm told the real figure is actually one. <laughs> I suppose actually trying to put a, a positive gloss on this, it means that if they carry on investing the 300 and £30,000 from the college funds that they were intending doing, at least it'll be a school with better class size ratio than the public schools have. But I think that we really need to see a stand up and fighting back. And it does come down to the example that Mark talked about that if confidence can be given, if parents and teachers can work together, then I think that any campaign could be successful. I'm a proud product of comprehensive education and I'm sick to death of comprehensive education being scapegoated for all the ills of society. Uh, what is one of the best education systems on earth? It's Finland. Now, there's two reasons for that. One, it's the education system itself. They don't have private schools. They don't have selection. They don't have fragmentation. They have good, properly accountable local schools, properly resourced, with teachers who are respected and properly looked after. And the second thing is, they have a far more equal society than we have here in Britain. Now, we have to, of course, get rid of all this fragmentation, and that includes academies. It also includes segregating children by the bank balances of their parents, and segregating children as well by the religious convictions of their parents. If we take private schools, we subsidise private education in this country because they have charitable status. That is a subsidising of class privilege. We've got to scrap all charitable status for private schools. Yes. Simple as that. Yeah. And properly locally accountable schools, not these vanity projects like uh, free schools for the, for the sharp elbowed where you, you get these free schools set up in areas where there's no shortage uh, of school places, whilst areas where you desperately need schools aren't being properly looked after, it's ridiculous. But not just that, we have to deal with the inequalities as well. Do you know, I found this fascinating, one of the only times I set foot in a private school was to go to the City of London uh, school. And I went there with Fiona Miller, who's a campaigner for comprehensive education. We were campaign we were arguing against Jacob Rees Mogg. Now, I don't know if anyone <laughs> knows Jacob Rees Mogg, but he's basically a walking political uh, broadcast for the Labour Party, frankly. But <laughs> I think it's about well, I quite like Jacob, I hope we have. But 
the, the point I actually made to a lot of those kids was your parents are wasting your money because we were there to argue for the abolition of private education in the city of London school, quite something. And the point I was making is uh, children from privileged backgrounds actually do better at comprehensives than they do at private schools. So it's quite an interesting fact and that's because educational inequality is a reflection of social and economic inequalities in our society. There was a study about middle class kids in inner city schools and 15% of them ended up going to Oxford. And, and the reality is, at the age of five, and there's a study in Scotland that showed this, a child from a rich background has a vocabulary 18 months ahead of a five-year-old from the poorest background. That inequality starts from birth. The birth weight of a child from a poor family is lower than that of the birth weight from a richer family. It's the housing crisis. The fact that in London, this booming, prosperous capital city, one in four kids grow up in an overcrowded home with huge consequences for their health, their education uh, and their well-being. They're far, they do far worse at school because of the impact uh, on their lives. Uh, the fact that people turn up to school with poor diets or hungry for that matter. And that's why we have to deal with those underlying inequalities. We've got to invest in early years to actually redress the gap which starts literally at birth. We've got to have universal free school meals, both breakfast and at lunch. We can afford to do that. Not where you means test it and stigmatise people. We all went to schools where that happened. Not that sort of stigma. Uh, but we also deal with the housing crisis. Uh, we, we tackle those massive inequalities that mean that children from better off backgrounds do better than children from poorer backgrounds. It's not structure. The answer isn't fragmentation or setting up vanity projects for the sharp elbowed privileged people. It's not about dividing people by faith and breaking up communities. It's about learning from countries like Finland where they have a good, decent local school for everybody and that is what we should be fighting for. And we've got two together. Um, it's from Mika Nichols. Would increasing the budget on mental health be enough to save it? or have the government inflicted too much damage already? And Lauren Dove, is there any way that people outside the NHS can do more to save it? Kate. We have a crisis of mental health in this country, actually. 23% of us have some kind of mental illness in a one year period. So that's almost one in four, it's astonishingly high. And levels of mental ill health in a population are really closely correlated with income inequality. The more unequal countries have a much higher prevalence of mental illness. When we first wrote about this um, in the British Journal of Psychiatry, a psychiatrist wrote in and said, do Pickett and Wilkinson really believe that 23% of the British population have some kind of mental illness? Aren't we just pathologising ordinary emotions and labelling people as ill when they're not? And I thought about my immediate sort of family, my circle of friends, and I thought 23% might be an underestimate. <laughs> so, we've got everything, right? anxiety, depression, suicide, addiction, self-harming, bipolar disorder, autistic spectrum disorder, you know, you name it. We are a fun um, bunch of people to hang out with. <laughs> but the point is not whether or not we sometimes label somebody as having a disorder that they don't. You know, we say a child has attention deficit disorder when actually they're just, you know, a bit disruptive. Or whether we label somebody as clinically depressed or not. These measures of mental illness across different populations are measures of real distress. They, they look at symptoms, they look at people's reports of how they're feeling about things. And, and wherever we put the cut-off point for saying someone's clinically ill or not, we are seeing massive differences in population levels of mental ill health or lack of well-being closely related to inequality. Now that suggests that however much we spend on mental health treatment services, we equally need to do something about preventing that epidemic of mental ill health happening in the first place. And we believe that inequality is a direct cause of people's depression and anxiety, of their narcissism, of their addictions, and even of um, schizophrenia and psychosis. 
So we need to reduce inequality in society to deal with the root causes of those very, very distressing problems. But of course we also need um, a lot more money to be spent on mental health for children, for adolescents, for adults, for elderly people. All segments of the population are suffering from lack of access to proper treatment. You know, if these were broken legs, we'd fix them. But when it's broken minds, it's just too easy for us to turn away and ignore them. <coughs> so we do need to sort of be voting for people who will put mental health on an equal footing with physical health and people and for parties who will fund the NHS properly. And it's been said on this panel before tonight, um, but I will say it again. Governments can find the money to do the things they want to do. And if they want to save the NHS and reverse the privatisation that's gone on, they can do that. They can do it through progressive taxation. They can do it by going after tax avoidance, tax havens. They can do it through all kinds of measures. They can choose to stop spending on the things that most of us would not support. And they can find the money to do the things they want to do. Someone said, oh, you know, we're one, we are one of the richest countries in the world, and yet we choose to ignore the health and well-being of a vast, vast proportion of our populations. We could spend a little less on Trident and a little more on ourselves. To, to deal with the NHS, but it goes without saying that we've got to hold Labour to account to stick to their promise to reverse the Health and Social Care Act. And the fact that's on the agenda is because people fought. We owe it to our ancestors, we fought at such cost and sacrifice for <coughs> NHS. We don't let a government, let alone one that didn't win the last general election, strip our NHS away. So we've got to keep fighting. But I want to just mention about I want to, on mental health because it, it, it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about. Now, now, under this government, there's been a huge attack in stripping away of mental health provision. Even though the Liberal Democrats have spoken about giving mental health parity with, with other forms of health. But in reality, that's a nonsense, because beds have been uh, more likely to be stripped away for, for provision for mental health. Uh, we've had a, a huge cutbacks, which have particularly affected that area of the NHS. Uh, and we, we have to deal with that. There's, a, there's another point, actually, that I think is important. And and that's this. We live in a sexist and misogynistic society, and that manifests itself in lots of different ways. Domestic violence against women, rape, sexual assault, the fact that women are paid less and are focused in the lowest paid uh, and most insecure work and so on. And there's another important point, that it doesn't just oppress women, it actually damages some men. Because the biggest killer of men aged 50 and below is suicide. Over three quarters of all suicide in this country are men. And that is partly because of an aggressive form of masculinity that is constantly pushed. That if you are seen, when men are growing up, if you're seen to not be aggressive enough, to not leer at women enough, uh, to, to you know, not get into enough fights, then you're often subjected to sexist and homophobic abuse, stopping such a woman, stopping uh, so gay, those sorts of things. And that means when men encounter mental distress, they don't talk about their feelings and they don't seek help. And that kills men. And I think it's really interesting because Emma Watson, most famous for Harry Potter, she's been, um, she's been championing the He for She movement. And that's to encourage male solidarity with women. Now that's important on its own terms because men need to confront the sexist and misogynistic attitudes which oppress women and end in rape and sexual assault and, and so on. But the point she also made is the effect it has on men when it comes to mental health, depression, and at the very worst, suicide. So I'd say we have to fight against austerity. Suicide, again, is not just genders, class. Uh, according to the Samaritans, the poorest are 10 times more likely to end their own lives uh, than the richest. So we've got to fight for proper provision. But we've also got to fight against the sexism and misogyny of our society, which stops men from actually being there. I've been working with um, a family of asylum seekers from Sri Lanka for the last three years. 
Well, I'm not going into the details of the terrible tortures that they underwent. They've been in this country for five years now. Um, the government actually supported the, uh, the husband going to a body called the Medical Foundation to have a complete sort of report done on his injuries. And when their asylum claim was put in, the government's response, the Home Office letter said, well, these injuries that are detailed here, they could have happened in some other way, perhaps. And this guy is now absolutely sort of wrecked. His mental despair is absolutely enormous. The family is absolutely wonderful. They've got two young girls. The father was playing for one of the cricket teams in Barnsley. He got the Man of the, uh, the Year award for the second team last year. You couldn't find a nicer, more welcoming bunch of people. And yet this guy is descending into complete and utter despair because our government isn't prepared to give his family asylum in this country. And I think it's details like that that we need to look at that sort of show, apart from the other things that people have talked about, how people's lives are being wrecked in the most appalling way. Family that came to escape sort of uh, torture, actually being tortured in, in, in their own way. And we've seen plenty of stuff about sort of what's happening in the uh, detention centres, uh, really good reports on Channel 4 News just recently. So that, that, that's absolutely despicable. I just want to say something positive, which going back to the Freedom Riders, we've got a number of people involved in the Freedom Ride campaign who have had a very torrid time for a number of years because they've got very little money. And being involved in the campaign doesn't suddenly put food on your table, but what it does do, what it has done, is to make people feel proud and actually develop their self-worth. And I think there's a whole number of things that need to be done to tackle the problem about mental health. And obviously, the idea of getting money in to sort of like develop the resources is really important. But actually, if people are, do, are able to engage in some sort of a fight back that makes them feel, I am a person, I'm not just a, a, a number in somebody's box, that gives you a belief in yourself which is part of turning around and, and, and shrugging off some of those mental health problems. And so I think, as well as encouraging the next government to actually put money into the resort, into resourcing mental health, we, it comes back to what's been said a number of times, we need campaigns developing so that people feel I'm important, what I do can actually change the world around me as well. Um, well, it's not to uh, come on back to this question, the other part about the, the NHS, whether there's people that outside the NHS that could do more to campaign for it. I think the first thing is to remember why it is that the Tories and people like that want to take apart the NHS. They want to do that because they believe, they honestly believe, that nothing can really work in society unless there's a profit motive behind it. They believe that that's, they don't just believe that, I don't think they just believe that because that means that they can make a profit. They honestly believe that somehow it's a law of physics that if Balfour Beatty aren't involved in something, it will melt. They think that. And therefore, therefore, if you think how the NHS is at the moment, it's worth remembering that every day, that it does still exist for all of the ways in which it's been undermined, for all the ways in which you go into a hospital now and you think, have oh, I taken the wrong turn in because there's an upper crust and probably a jewellers and a whole shopping mall <laughs> and then <laughs> somehow it's sort of at the end somewhere with the green bacon. But despite all of that, the NHS does exist, it is still there in the form it was meant to be. I know there's plenty of things wrong with it, but it is still there despite the fact that for 30 years we've had governments who hate it, who hate the idea of it. They want to be like America. When you see the debates there are in America about what was called Obamacare, which was bringing in just the mildest form of something like a collective health system. And they went berserk, the people who make all the money out of it, so, telling stories such as the NHS. The NHS in Britain is in effect a death panel. They decide who lives and who dies. <laughs> Just whatever mad thing the tea party or Sarah Palin can, can dream up. They hate it, and yet it's still there. And that proves that there are things that we can do despite the fact, you know, we're, we're, regardless of whether we're part of the NHS, to campaign for it, because all of these things have happened. So what they have to do, they know they can't privatise it, they know they dare even suggest that, so they do it bit by bit. 
So the car parks, for example, I can't believe, every time I say this figure, I think I'm going to have to check that up and can't be right. The company that runs the car parks in Britain made £90 million profit in a year from car parks. It used to be free. I don't sound like an old man. I love the fact that, I love the fact that Sam says, oh, that was back seven years ago, as if that's a long time. <laughs> uh, but back a real long time ago, 20 years ago, whatever, the idea of paying, I mean, it's what a, what a marvellous testimony it is to the profit motive that these people think Aha! All these people who go there are sick. They've got no choice but to park by the next hospital. We can't lose. That's how they think of it. And so, uh, and so, bit by bit, all the things, the little bits that come, the food, the cake, the agencies, all these bits on the fringes of the the health. Well, not so much on the fringes, the cleaning and so on. They privatise that bit by bit. But nonetheless, despite Thatcher and Blair and all of these. Vultures hovering over the nation's health, thinking this is marvellous, people are sick, we can make money. Despite all of those people doing that for all of that time, the fights and the campaigns and the arguments that have gone on have meant that we've still got it. Protests still be needed whoever wins the election. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's really a chance to go over some of the things that we were all talking about earlier on, isn't it? That on May the 8th there is going to be a government in power which is going to be doing what the IMF and the European Bank insist that it does. And that's going to mean more austerity, more attacks on us, more privatisation of the NHS, more academies coming into education. All of that is there. And the only way that's going to be defeated is if people turn around and say, no, we're not going to accept this. And I just want to sort of like play on the age thing a bit, because I can remember in 1974, Ted Heath coming into government. And I think a lot of people in the room won't actually have that memory of Ted Heath. And it's worth looking at about his government because Ted Heath was Margaret Thatcher before Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister. Ted Heath was elected on the basis of saying that he wasn't going to um, keep putting money into British industry in the way that Wilson, uh, Wilson's government had done beforehand. Ted Heath said there will be no lame ducks under this government. He brought in very vicious anti-union legislation. It was a real vicious attack on the working class movement and it was resisted. You know, people might have heard of the Pentonville Dockers. People were locked up for actually taking action against their employers when the docks were being privatised and they were released because people demonstrated, threatened to come out on strike and they created this title of someone called the official solicitor who suddenly appeared on the scene and got them out of prison after it had been said that they couldn't come out. We saw the first miners strike in 1972 in the post-war period which led to a fantastic improvement in the wages and conditions of miners and then in 1974 the second miners strike which led to Ted Heath in a period of the three day week. Ted Heath saying, I'm going to call the election and the question is, who rules this country? Is it the government or is it the miners? And Ted Heath lost that election. What that showed is that no matter how vicious the attack against our class, if our class is prepared to stand up and fight back, we can beat the most vicious, rotten people in government, no matter how well they organize, we've got the strength we need to keep shouting it out loud and proud. And I'm convinced that if we do that, then in the period of the next government, we will start to see the upsurge, and perhaps we'll be celebrating our version of the Arab Spring, where people come out and actually say, we're going to bring a government down if we want to do what we want, and we're going to make sure we get something that benefits us all. I totally agree with that. I mean, 
We all know that whatever the result of the election, whatever the result, we still face years of austerity to come. We all know that even if we were in a situation where we had uh, an anti-austerity government uh, like they did in Greece, like they did elect uh, Syriza in Greece, yet they have now made uh, some concessions in, in Greece, they've, had, they've been forced to make some concessions, uh, but what, even if we were in that situation, we'd still need strikes, we'd still need demonstrations, we'd still need activity. Wherever the government comes in power, we have to keep the pressure on uh, the, to, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what we all need to uh, we all need to see, we all know that it's not the governments uh, that pull the strings behind uh, behind the scenes. Um, but so, but in terms of this uh, this uh, the situation that we face ourselves at the moment, I think we've seen uh, over the past well since the defeat of the miners, I suppose. Trade union, traditional struggle, traditional trade union struggle has been low. We've gone through a kind of, uh, in terms of uh, strike action, in terms of trade union membership, has been on the decline over the last uh, over the last few years. However, um, what I think we could, what I think we have seen is a complete an increase in the level of political radicalisation that's happening across the country. I think we've seen much more demonstrations. We've seen much. Uh, more of these kinds of things. So I think it's our responsibility to rebuild the trade union movement. It's our responsibility to rebuild uh, those kind of traditions because our strongest weapon that we have is our ability to withdraw our labour. That is uh, the strongest weapon that we have. Um, so I think uh, going forwards, we need to see the demonstrations, the movements, all of these kind of things as a way of building confidence to take further action in the workplace. That's what we need to be doing, that's, and that's why the trade unions need to remain uh, at the heart of, uh, of the People's Assembly and of the anti-austerity movement. But that's also why the People's Assembly, just six weeks after the election, is going to be calling a national demonstration. We're going to be assembling that demonstration in the heart of the city, outside the Bank of England, uh, and marching to one of the poorest areas in London, uh, well, one of the poorest boroughs, in the country, actually, Tower Hamlets, uh, which is right next door to the city of London. Uh, I think it's everybody's duty here today to make sure that that demonstration is the biggest possible demonstration uh, that it can be. That can send a very, very clear message to whatever government gets in power that the anti-austerity movement is not going away. It's only getting bigger. Uh, and we will continue to be a thorn in the side to any government that remains committed to austerity. Um, so, and we're going to be putting on coaches from all across the country. There's coaches going down from York uh, here. I think there's going to be a collection at the door because what we don't want a single person to miss that demonstration because they can't afford to get down to it. So please, on your way out, drop as much money as you can in the bucket and that, all of that money will go towards bringing people down who can't afford to get down there, to giving them free places on the coaches. And between now and the 20th of June, go back to your trade union branches, go back to your workplaces, your workmates, make sure your family, your friends, everybody that possibly can uh, comes on that demonstration because I think we can get hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets. We'll create a, a pole of attraction in society when the, all you hear from the mainstream is the politics of austerity and we'll make a, send a very clear message that we'll no longer accept this and that we demand the alternative. So please do that and see you on the next I feel almost as weepy as when I was watching Pride. <laughs> um, when I withdraw my labour, I don't think anybody notices. <laughs> I was off work for three months once and I was surprised how many people didn't seem to know. <laughs> but we don't all do the same kind of work. So we can but we can all do different things. You know, what I do a lot is comparative research, looking at how this country is doing in comparison to others, bringing people's attention to that, trying to understand the processes by which inequality damages society. I write about it in different forums. Owen writes in, in different places. Um, Mark is very funny, gets people to listen, gets them engaged. I'm amazed by what you've done in Barnsley, Sam, you're organising with all to, you know, go down on buses, but we can all do different things. So some of us, it will be activism and campaigning. 
And for some of us, it will be stuffing leaflets in envelopes and knocking on people's doors. And for others, it will be talking to our employers and trying to get them to pay the living wage. Or it will be signing petitions. It will be whether we choose to vote or not. But we all have different things to do. But I think one of the most important things that all of us can do is to treat one another with kindness and respect and expect everyone else in society to behave in that way as well. That we all value each other and we expect everybody else to value us too. And that we expect that before we give them our respect. Um, and that we all, yeah, we join hands and we stay in this together, properly in this together. Clearly, the person uh, that put the question does believe that we need strikes and protests <laughs> after the election because I suppose there's one of maybe three possibilities after the election. One is that the Labour Party sort of reverts back to, to being as Tony Blair was. Uh, my old friend Linda Smith, who is sadly not around with us anymore, I remember about before the Iraq War, about 2002, uh, her comment about Tony Blair, she said, you know, before Tony Blair got in, I had no illusions in him whatsoever, no expectations in the slightest, not one. And even I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that will happen necessarily, but if that does, then obviously strikes and protests will be necessary to change things. On the other hand, supposing Ed Miliband's government turned out to be extraordinarily radical and it was some sort of Hugo Chavez type situation, <laughs> even more unlikely I would grant you. But even if it did, then that would not mean strikes and protests wouldn't have to happen because then the people in power would do all they possibly could to stop them being able to carry those things out. If it's some sort of mixture of anywhere between those two, then obviously strikes and protests will be needed as well, because the people who run society are the people who own and control the way we produce things, the people who control the banks and the insurance companies, the finance and the factories around the world and so on. These people own and control that stuff and they want to carry on owning and controlling it and in such a way that they make the maximum possible profit. And if there is any laws that are brought about or any change that means that that is reduced and that their ability to make maximum profit is thwarted in any way, they will do all they can to make sure that it goes back to how it was. So for those reasons, whoever wins the election, that will be the case. But far from meaning that that is hopeless, and far from even meaning that we sort of, well then we need to start a movement or something, even what we have now has changed things because it is part of the picture, part of the, the global picture is that there is protest, that there is in all sorts of hidden ways, ways in which they cannot get their way. They haven't won the argument. If you've said anybody now, uh, the, the majority of people believe in this country believe that the railways should be renationalised, for example, that the energy companies are hated, which means that Ed Miliband is able to sound reasonably militant on, on these issues. That is because of all the meetings like this. It doesn't happen automatically. If people are just sat and done nothing, it's all the different, even if it's writing a letter to the paper, whatever complaint the form comes in, then those things have made a difference. So just one, just one example that I think worth, I'll, I'll finish on, is that if people think nothing can make a difference, just the example of gay marriage, now, the Labour Party, for example, will generally say you can't really win anything unless you win over the middle ground, and that's often an excuse for agreeing with Nigel Farage or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true you have to win over the middle ground, but it doesn't just have to be by agreeing with them. You can win them over. 20 years ago, if you were in favour of gay marriage, you were an extremist. If any politician had suggested that they supported gay marriage, I think Ken Livingston did, I'm not even sure he went that far, he was pilloried as an absolute idiot. And now you're an extremist if you're against it. And that hasn't happened. No, they just said extraordinary. I love the one that 
Yeah, there is still, what's his name? I don't remember, there's one of them who still says, it undermines my marriage between me and my wife once two men can get married, which makes me think he must have the, the most fragile marriage. <laughs> You see, there's two people we've never heard of and don't care about are getting married. Really? Well, pack your bags and fuck off. <laughs> they sound as crazy as they are. And that has happened because of all the meetings of the campaigns, the things like this where people have raised it, they've won people round. You might not think you're doing anything different, but you're talking to your neighbour, the person at work, your own family, whatever, and winning them round. And all of this that we're here tonight of is part of this huge, massive campaign that may not be as dramatic and as exciting as the one that you know, certainly was exciting if you were part of it that, that uh, George was talking about there of the Dockers in the 1970s. But nonetheless, it is part of a massive campaign to say that the human race is about a lot more than profit. And it's about that campaign saying that we can produce a better world than the one that they've got. And even as it is now, that is making a difference. I've been very rude to keep occasionally looking at my phone to check out how the leaders debate's going. It's going very well. <laughs> so about 23 minutes in, a black hole appeared and uh, sucked in Nigel Farage and David Cameron. So we won. <laughs> um, the answer to the question is, is yes, of course, yes. Uh, people might know this quote, it's my favourite quote. Frederick Douglass, a 19th century African-American statesman. And he said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Everything we have, all the gains, all the rights, were not given to us as acts of generosity and goodwill by the powerful. The powerful didn't wake up one day and think, oh, I'm feeling generous, I'll give women the vote. <laughs> People had to fight, often at great cost and at great sacrifice. <coughs> and that's the history of this country we don't talk about enough. The top of the martyrs who fought for the basic right of having a trade union back in the 19th century. They were deported to Australia as punishment, and hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets in one of the first great political demonstrations in the history of this island and demanded their return. The other early trade unionists who fought for the rights and dignity of working people. The Chartists, the world's first great working class political movement that fought for democracy, in the 19th century. The suffragettes now lauded almost as secular saints, but in their time reviled and detested as anarchists and terrorists, locked up in prisons and forced them. Those who fought for the National Health Service and the welfare state in the teeth of determined opposition from the powerful. Those who fought racism and sexism and homophobia, battened by police officers, spat at in the streets. Those who fought the poll tax, who didn't just get rid of the poll tax, but booted Margaret Thatcher out of number 10 to boot as well. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Everything we have, all those rights and all those gains won by people in this room, by your mothers, your fathers, your grandmothers, your grandfathers, your ancestors before that. And it is not for us to allow many of the things that our ancestors fought for at such cost and at such sacrifice to be stripped away by a government which didn't even win the last general election. Absolutely. It's up to all of us to do that. We've got to keep that tradition alive. We've got to have the courage and the determination and the hope that our ancestors showed. They were up against what seemed like completely insurmountable odds. Odds that were far more insurmountable than those that confront all of us today. We live in a society which is rigged in favour of the mean and the greedy at the top. Tax dodgers, bankers, poverty paying bosses. But it doesn't have to be that way. It's up to all of us to change that. We can build a society run in favour of the real wealth creators, working people. The people who keep this country ticking day after day by hand or by brain. But it's up to all of us to have that same courage and that same determination and that same hope. And as our ancestors overcame, we too will overcome as well. Nelson Mandela said, it seems impossible until it is done. But well, we've got to keep the torch 
burning bright. Whoever is in government, we will fight for a different sort of society. And if we have that same courage, if we have that same determination, and we have that same hope, then we will win. If we stand together, we fight together, then we will win every single battle together. Thank you. Yeah, we want to thank, and to you. <laughs>